The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing of the sun, of the soul, and the spirit, and the joints, and the marrow, and is a critic of faults and intents of the heart. All scripture is God's breathing and is profitable for a doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped and furnished for every good work. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. If you will, open the word of truth to 2 Timothy. Word of truth to 2 Timothy. Be courageous and faithful, even in the midst of difficulties. <clears throat> that is God's encouragement to you this morning is always be courageous and faithful, even in the midst of difficulties. That is Paul's encouragement to Timothy as he approached death. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, with first dwelt in your grandmother uh, um, grand, uh, Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the land on of my hand. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound word which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. In this salutation, go back up to verse one, and we'll start this morning. Last week, we did an introduction, and this morning, we'll begin to look at each one of these verses, verse by verse. In the first part, we will look at this morning is verse 1 and 2. And in verse 1 and 2, we see Paul's salutation. Uh, and in this salutation, he gives a description of himself and his performance. He gives a description of himself and his performance. Paul, an apostle. Paul, an apostle. Now, this word apostle is the Greek word apostolos, and it's simply one who is sent, one who is sent. And it describes a man who is officially commissioned by an authorizing agent. And this man is given the authority to perform a task. This title carried with it authority of the one who authorized this person to carry out the task. So Paul say, I am an apostle. Now the word apostle originally and historically referred to a high ranking officer 
sent out by his superior on a mission to govern uh, uh, a fleet of men. In the New Testament, the word carries the same uh, connotation of commission, someone commissioning you and giving you a responsibility. He said, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ was the one who commissioned him and gave him the responsibility uh, uh, to be an apostle. Now, there was uh, uh, 12 apostles, 12 disciples who were appointed to be apostles to Israel for the purpose of authenticating uh, the message that the Savior has arrived. The apostle message was the message that the Savior had arrived. And we see that in Matthew 10, 1 through 4. Now, following the resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, his ascension back to heaven, there were two forms of apostleship. You had the uh, first a uh, 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 form of apostleship and the main purpose of apostleship was to establish churches, to establish churches. And, and, and Paul had this gift of apostleship. Now, this gift of apostleship was a temporary gift. It was a temporary spiritual gift and it was given to the 12, uh, 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 but a labyrinth of those uh, served as apostles um, after the church age began, and Paul felt that vacant office that Judas lost, and so he was considered an apostle. Now, that gift was bestowed by the Holy Spirit, and each uh, apostle was commissioned personally by the resurrected Jesus Christ. And one of the qualifications of being an apostle is you have to have seen Jesus and been commissioned directly by Jesus Christ. This was probably the highest uh, 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 ranking uh, gift uh, uh, that the church was ever give, given. So no wonder men covet this office. No more wonder even men today covered the office of apostleship because it was the highest ranking gift uh, given to the uh, church. Now, these apostles communicated the gospel. They communicated church age doctrines. Uh, they established churches. They trained and they ordained um, pastor teachers. They wrote books of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Do we have any man today on the face of the earth that is still writing the New Testament or still writing scripture? Because when we look at the apostles in the New Testament or after the church age, they all wrote scripture. They all wrote scripture. They founded churches. And, and they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. As the Bible says in 2 Peter 1, go to 2 Peter 1, verse 16 through 21. When these men spoke, their message carried with it authority because their message was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Their message and their word was not their words. Their message and their word was directly from the Holy Spirit. Second Peter verse uh, one, uh, chapter one, verse uh, 16 uh, through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitness of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in, our, in your heart. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. In other words, scripture did not originate in the mind of the men who wrote scripture. 
Scripture did not originate in the minds of the men who wrote Scripture. Verse 21, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of the human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And as an apostle of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit spoke directly to Paul, and Paul recorded what the Holy Spirit wanted him to write. Now, amongst the gift of an apostle, we have the, the gifts of tongues and miracles and healing. And as we just saw, uh, the gift of prophecy. And those gifts, like tongues and miracles and healing, those gifts was uh, uh, gifts that a lot of the apostles had. And, but those gifts had a purpose. But the purpose of those gifts was to uh, gain the attention of those who hear their message, to show them that, hey, our message carried with it authority. And here's the evidence that we are sent from God and that we are God's representative, that what we're saying is true. And they will perform miracles. They speak in tongues and, 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 and they will prophesy uh, which shows that their message is from God to motivate people to believe. Now, today, uh, this authority of apostleship and credential do not exist. Just because someone is a sent one, uh, a missionary or an evangelist, don't necessarily make him an apostle. Uh, we don't have an apostle today as uh, Paul and the 12 disciples was. Uh, 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 there may be men establishing churches, but uh, they don't perform miracles, signs, and wonders authenticating their messages. They're not writing scripture. Scripture have already been written and completed. And so the authority and credential of a, a apostleship do not even exist today. Uh, it has been discontinued once the Bible was completed. So there's nobody still, God is not still writing scripture. He's not, he's all, everything he wants us to know is right here in the Bible, all right? And so Paul give his credential, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. I love that. He say, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now this, in other words, it was God's plan that I be an apostle. It was not my plan. It was no one appointed me as an apostle. No man appointed me as an apostle. God did it. It was God's will that Paul be commissioned and given the responsibility to spread the message about the Savior, Jesus Christ, and the mystery doctrine of the church. He was commissioned directly by Jesus, would give his apostleship authority for the one who sent him. There's a lot of men today that carry this title, uh, this, this badge of apostleship. And what they're saying is that there's no one among human with as high as office than me. Now give me your money. <laughs> and actually, that's what it's really all about. It's all about money. It's all about money, power, and control. And um, But he, Paul said, I was commissioned. My commission was the will of God. You know, with him saying that, here it is, he's in a dungeon, he's in a jail, uh, awaiting to die. And he said that my commission was given to me by God. So that explains why Paul had so much endurance. That's why he had so much endurance, so much courage. When everyone deserted him, remember, he's in jail. And at this particular time, being a Christian was very dangerous. Being associated with any of the leaders in the Christian church was very dangerous. He'd been abandoned by most of his friends. But guess what? He had endurance. He had courage when everyone deserted him because he had the assurance that, you know what? I am doing the will of God. I'm doing the will of God. I'm doing things to help others. I'm bringing them the gospel message. I did not live for myself. 
but I was living for others as the will of God required of me. I'm suffering because of my ministry. And so he's confident in doing God's will. If we're doing God's will, we never need to fret, be discouraged, or be dismayed. If we're doing God's will, the future is bright. The future is bright even in the most adverse circumstance. But we question our future when we know that we're not doing what God have told us we need to be doing. If we're not fulfilling our responsibility, we will live in fear. We will be discouraged and we will not have endurance in the face of difficulty and adversity. But Paul knew that I am doing the will of God. Even when others desert me, I am not going to be dismayed. So no wonder he had that, that joy and that peace and uh, strength, even in the midst of adversity. The last part of verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. I learned a secret here. I saw something. Paul chose to focus in his situation on the promise of life. On the promise of life eternal. And see, that's what the gospel does. When you present the gospel, within that gospel is a promise of eternal life to those who believe. And so instead of focusing on his death, which he knows he's about to die, he focused on the promises of God. And see, when we focus on the promises of God, it gives us tranquility of soul, even in the most difficult situation. Even when I'm on my bed, dying. I have tranquility of soul because I have the gospel in my mind which promise eternal life. So therefore, even on my deathbed, I have peace. I have no fear. I have no fear even on my deathbed because I am holding on to God's promise. I am contemplating the promise of eternal life. And what is eternal life? Eternal life is life as God has it. God, eternal life, have no beginning, no ending. Eternal life is God's life. And all three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have this life. They always existed and will exist. And the moment a person believed in Jesus Christ, God give as a gift his own eternal life. And then, in other words, he will allow them to live forever with him in heaven, in resurrection, glorified body. No more crying, no more sickness, no more death, no more child support. <laughs> None of the difficulties of this life is done once you have eternal life. That day is coming. And that's all Paul thought about in his situation. So it was his mission in life and the reason for his appointment to make known this promise of eternal life in the gospel. His whole mind was consumed with that message. See, eternal life is that spirit of life that is Christ Jesus. See, knowing Christ as Messiah and Savior is knowing and receiving eternal life. God in the gospel message promised eternal life to those who believe. Go to John 17, 3. John 17, 3. John 17, 3. The gospel of John 17, 3. The gospel of John 17, verse 3. Verse 3 of chapter 17, say, Jesus said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus said, This is eternal life. And John record Jesus' word here, This is eternal life. And then go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. 1 John 
chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. 1 John, chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. And this is the other John, John, first letter, uh, first John, second John, and third John, close right before Jude in Revelation. All right, verse 11 say, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. So we see assurance here. So what was Paul thinking about as he await his death in a Roman prison for the second time? He have occupied his mind with the eternal life that will be realized in the future. He had assurance and this assurance <clears throat> gave him confidence and endurance. It kept him from having a pity party. He saw God as being the faithful God, the one who is faithful to his promises. God promised, gave Paul tranquility of soul, even in the face of death. The promises of God give peace in the midst of a storm. You know how a, uh, 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 when it's storming outside, some birds be singing even when it's storming. And that's how believers should be. We should be singing even in a jail cell. Long as we're doing God's will, we should be singing. That is that tranquility of soul. And the only way you can have tranquility of soul, you must know God's promises. You must believe God's promises. You must apply God's promises to the circumstance. And then you just rest in the promises of God. If you don't know it, you study in the word. If you don't believe it, and if you don't apply it to the situation, all you have is stress. All you have is complaining, pity party, when you don't concentrate on the promises of God. See, Paul was in that, Paul was faithful. He was a faithful man to God because he knew God was faithful. And God had already been faithful to him throughout his life. And therefore, Paul was motivated to be faithful just as God was faithful to him. See, when God is faithful to us in doing what he say he's going to do, then we are obligated to be faithful to him. In the midst of all odds, in the midst of difficulties, we should not throw the towel in. We should not roll it up and say, I want to commit suicide because of my difficulty. No, you be faithful to the plan of God, even in the midst of difficulty. See, Timothy need to remain faithful. And that is why Paul writing this, this letter, because Timothy need to remain faithful. He was faithful. Paul didn't have no doubts about Timothy faithful, faithfulness, but he need to remain faithful to God. Be remain faithful to your ministry, even when others are being low-key Christians, even when others is, is not sharing their faith. Even when others are, are cowards and, and shrinking away from sharing the gospel or being associated with, with those, uh, those aggressive Christians, <laughs> those Christians that are just so fired up for Jesus, people tend to don't want to associate. Hey, hey, that's too much. Hey, you're doing too much. All this talking about Jesus around me and my friends. Hey, I don't know. I don't know Hawkins. He too, he's such a, a Jesus freak. <laughs> Let me, you know, I'm going to have to, you know, hey, hey, take that somewhere else. Even Christians act like that sometimes. If they see the, the, the pastor coming around, they're like, oh, that's, that's a pastor. They go to hide under the bleachers. With, with. <laughs> I'm with my friends now, and what are they going to say if I'm sitting here talking to the man of God? And, 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 uh, I tell you, if you want to run people who are really not your friends away, just go to talking about Jesus. You go to sharing the word of God with him in God's perspective. You're right there. I tell, I tell game members in the prison, I say, hey, you don't have to tell nobody that you're giving up the games and all that. Just live for Jesus and proclaim God's message. You will run everybody away. <laughs> 
You're right all the gang. They, you ain't got to tell them, hey, I'm no longer sick. I'm no longer claiming sex. I'm no longer crip. You ain't got to tell them that. Just go to talking about Jesus and talking about the word of God and sharing your faith, and they will run away from you. You won't even have to worry about it. Men of Paul, uh, fellow workers, had forsaken him, the messenger, and the message, their ministers, because they were cowards. They were afraid. God had been faithful to them, but yet they were not willing to be faithful to God. Even amidst the ridicule, even amidst the opposition and persecution, they was not willing to be faithful and share their faith. Or be associated with those who are just aggressive in their ministry like Paul. Paul was an aggressive evangelist minister. In verse 2, to Timothy, my beloved son, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice his affection in his, uh, for Timothy. He said, my beloved son. This was a term, uh, the word son, beloved son, was a term of endearment showing uh, Paul affection for Timothy. Timothy was like a spiritual son to Paul. He got recruited when he was about 20 years old. His grandparents and his mom got converted on Paul's first missionary journey. And, and, and Paul gave them a, they were Jews, and Paul gave them a new perspective about the Old Testament. You know, because remember when Paul got, he knew the Old Testament, but when he got saved, uh, he had to go to the Arabian deserts and man, I've been having this thing all wrong. I didn't even see Jesus in the Old Testament. Let me go back and, 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 and search the scripture. And he saw Jesus in the Old Testament, the one who had already came. And when he pre presented the gospel, that is that new perspective that he shared with these Jews like Timothy's parents. And what did they do? Well, Timothy's dad was a Greek. And so he probably would not allow uh, 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 his uh, his wife and the grandmother to influence Timothy. But when he died, those women, they began to uh, uh, impart truths about Christ in the Old Testament in this young man. And this young man became an evangelist. He became an evangelist. And when Paul came back through on the second missionary trip to his hometown, this young man was fired up. He would evangelize and everybody was talking about it. Could everybody talk about, man, boy, Sumner, he can't, I, I saw him down there on the corner down there, just John the Baptist, <laughs> sharing his faith. Do people talk about your faith or your display of your faith, faith in the community? When Paul came around that second time, Everybody was talking about Timothy, his evangelism, his faithfulness, and sharing the gospel and the message. And Paul said, man, I need this young man to be my protege. <laughs> I need him with me. I need him to become my student. I have use for that. So Paul had nurtured this man at an early age, even though he already had a good reputation as a missionary. Uh, he became a student, and from a student, he became what? A co-laborer. And from a co-laborer, he became a son in the faith. Because remember, he did not have a dad. His dad had died. And so Timothy was like his spiritual son. But one thing I, I, I noticed about Paul is that whenever Paul encouraged Timothy or charged him to do something, He's not encouraging him or challenging him to do something that he's not already doing. <laughs> he's not encouraging him to do something. Paul had lived an exemplary life before this young man. This young man has seen Paul in different situations, how he responded. Uh, 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 he was like a father to him. He kept him at his side. And there's many young men today, and Christian young men, that need people like Paul around them to display an exemplary life before them, to be their mentor. Uh, 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 many men need men in their lives that can mentor them uh, through their lives. Um, uh, they had a close relationship, as he mentioned many times in his letter. 
Let's go down to verse uh, 3. In verse 3, we see Paul giving thanks for his faithful workers. Paul giving thanks for his faithful workers. In verse 3, he said, I thank God. I have thanks to God whom I serve. Paul just reveals something else about himself. He said he apostle in verse 1, but then in verse 2, I mean, verse 3, he said, I am a servant. I am one who have no will of my own. I live totally for the will of the one who have called me or commissioned me. That's what the word serve me or servant. It means a slave for life. Someone who have given up their own will for the will of the one who have called and commissioned him. So Paul said, I thank God whom I serve. I give gratitude for favor that have been given to me by God. And why? who is he giving thanks for? He said, with a clear conscience, the way my forefather did, as I constant remember you in my prayers night and day. So as Paul remembered Timothy, he found encouragement. He found encouragement. And he needed this encouragement in a time like this, in prison, about to die. And he thanked God every time he remembered Timothy, because Timothy brought great encouragement to Paul. My question to you is that when people begin their prayers in the mornings, in the evening, in the afternoon, do they say, Lord, I thank you for Brian. I thank you for Keithy and I thank you for Paul. But the only way people are going to thank God for us, we can't be living for ourselves. We have to be serving God's purpose in the world. We have to be serving people, bringing encouragement to them, helping them carry out the responsibility that God have called them to carry out. See, I know many people well, actually, every time I see you guys come here on Sunday morning, come on the Zoom Bible study, that brings encouragement to me. So I say, Lord, thank you for these believers, because it's very encouraging. It's very encouraging. Are you coming alongside believers to encourage and help them carry out the responsibility to God as you carry out your responsibility to God? Or are you living for self? Paul found encouragement and reason to give thanks to God because every time he thought about that believer, Timothy, I know on my dying bed, I want many people to think about because that's going to help me get through what I'm going through. <laughs> Timothy was an encouragement to this man about to die. And as a result, what did he do in verse three? It say. I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. He prayed for him day and night. And then in verse four, I mean, verse four, he say, I long to see you. In other words, I want to see you, Timothy. I'm about to die. I won't be here long, but I want to see you because seeing you will bring encouragement to me. When people see you, did that bring encouragement to them? Or, they, or do they hate to see you? Or to wish, I don't want to see him today. And then in verse 4, he said, Long to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. In verse 5, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you. So here's what encouraged him. He said, I am mindful. I am confident of your faith. <clears throat> When first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. So Paul had complete confidence that Timothy's faith was sincere. What does it mean to have sincere faith? Faith without pretense. Faith without pretense. His faith did not appear true as some, but was true. See, that was a lot of believers that was not providing encouragement for Timothy because their faith was just pretense. They were pretending that they had true faith, but they were demonstrating 
that they did not have true faith. See, Timothy wasn't wearing a mask on Sunday. He wasn't mad wearing a mask during the week. Timothy was without hypocrisy. He was not wavering in his profession of faith. This man was firm in his faith. See, people who are wavering in their profession of their faith don't bring a whole lot of encouragement to missionaries. <laughs> they don't bring a whole lot of encouragement to men like Paul in the face of adversity. But then what he's saying in verse 6, and we'll, we'll close with this. In verse 6, he's saying, for this reason, for this reason, I remind you to kinder afresh Timothy, don't let the fire go out. Don't let the fire go out. Kinder or fret. So if he has to charge Timothy to kinder or fret something, that means that the fire was going out. The fire was going out. Maybe he was not as excited, well, as excited or as, you know, he probably could think about it. You know, all his old friends, and all co-workers have abandoned their ministries. And you're just standing there feeling all along, you know, you know, there's a few like Paul, but have you ever been there where you look around and nobody seems to be as excited as you are? <laughs> you can get kind of a little discouraged a little bit, but it seems like you're in it all by yourself. But he say, stir up. Don't let the flame go out. Keep the Moldering emblems in, 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 in flame. Keep full flame. In other words, don't be ashamed. He said, uh, keep full flame. The gift which is in you through the laying on of my hand. You have a spiritual gift. You have a spiritual gift. Uh, 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 don't, don't, don't neglect that gift. God having made, gave you a spirit of fear. Stop neglecting your gift. Stop neglecting the message of the gospel. And, and, and don't be don't be uh, ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed uh, of me as the minister of the gospel, because everybody else was doing it. And Paul would just encourage him: Don't be like everybody else. Don't run with the crowd. Don't run with the crowd who has abandoned their faith, who are hypocrites. Don't run with the crowd who don't want to associate uh, uh, with uh, those Christians who are. Uh, uh, serious about their faith and are faithful. Keep full of flame. Don't let what everybody is doing influence you. Keep doing what God has called you to do. All right, we're going to start right here and we'll pick up here when we come back on next week. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're so grateful uh, for men like Paul and men like Timothy. Well, even in a, a face of difficulties, uh, was confident, was courageous, had hope, had tranquility of soul, and they revealed to us through their lives how we can have tranquility of soul even in the midst of persecution. Help us to endure by your grace and be faithful even when everyone else is not faithful. Help us to be faithful so that we can make an impact in the world. Help us not be ashamed of the message that can save a lost person. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a good day.